Tonight's our verse, first virtual symposium, and we're so glad to have you as our guest tonight. Tonight was the originally scheduled date for our science symposium. We were supposed to be together at Hampton Base High School in the auditorium. We know that that's not possible tonight, but I'm sure that as we meet virtually and learn virtually from four amazing science researchers in their senior year, that you're going to leave a little bit smarter, and more, more importantly, most importantly, more inspired about the potential of our young people and the research that they're doing and what that means in the world today. As we begin, I wanna take a moment on behalf of the Board of Education and the entire Hampton Bay Schools community to wish each of you well. We hope that as you watch tonight's symposium, you and your family are healthy and staying physically, mentally, and emotionally connected. In so many important ways, the Hampton Bay Schools is committed to moving forward daily. In times of great challenge, humans naturally seek what's familiar and what's comfortable. It reinforces our sense of security and it reinforces our sense of optimism that this too shall pass and that the challenges and worries, while very real and very scary for us today, will at some point be in our rearview mirror. So that's why as a school district, we decided to move ahead with tonight's symposium. While we would of course prefer to be with you in person here at Hampton Bays High School, we'll connect virtually and enjoy the comfort and familiarity of our greatest assets in Hampton Bays, our students. I'd like to acknowledge some special guests who are watching with us this evening in the comfort and safety of their own homes. President of the Board of Education, Kevin Springer, Vice President, Rich Joslin, and members Dot Capuano, Ann Colhane, and Liz Scully. Our elected officials whose lives every day have been consumed with keeping our communities healthy and safe are with us as well. State Assemblyman Fred Thiel, Southampton Town Councilman John Bouvier, Rick Martell, and Tommy John Scavoni. We thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedules to be with us and show support. We know that you take good care of the Hampton Bays community. We wish you well in the work that you're doing on our behalf. I'd also like to acknowledge the mentors in the field and from around the nation who have will willingly committed to support these student researchers in their work over the last four years. As you'll hear from Riley tonight, her extremely timely topic on epidemiology is demanding the 24 seven attention of her mentors at Johns Hopkins. That said, she's still been able to connect and learn and work with her mentors even during this pandemic. The commitment that our mentors make is authentic. It significantly impacts the trajectory of our researchers' work, and you're gonna see that tonight. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge the university and the high school program at the University of Albany, the University at Albany, and its directors who are watching from afar tonight. We value this tremendous partnership, and we have since day one, seven years ago. We appreciate your commitment to us, your willingness to help us innovate, and especially tonight, your support in launching our first innovative virtual symposium. The Research and Science Program at Hampton Bays provides students a rigorous applied science experience over four years. At Hampton Bays, we research diabetes, epidemiology, the human body, and much more. We question cancer, daily stress, connections to your environment. We study the frontier of manufacturing and communication. The beauty of science research is that as we conduct that research and as we question and consider, students usually end the day with more questions than when they began. And their research morphs into new ideas and new questions and new frontiers. This discovery learning, as Dr. Forsberg says, creates good researchers who should question more than they answer. Tonight, you will see not just what students have learned so far, but what they have uncovered as places to take their research next. The frustrating beauty of science research is that after four years, our seniors are putting a neat bow on their high school careers and about to begin a life that continues to question and continues to seek truth, to research problems and innovate breakthroughs in our society. So while the work is ending on one front, it's beginning on a very other important one. Eleanor Roosevelt said that small minds discuss people 
average minds discuss events and that it's great minds who discuss ideas. Quite easily and understandably, we can find ourselves lost in talking about the day to day and who helped or hurt us, especially right now as we navigate our new normal. It's in room 12, however, and now on Zoom, where there's an unending discussion of ideas. And as you meet our four science researchers tonight, I hope you leave with a new idea, a wondering, a new question. In Hampton Bays, the Research and Science Program is our premier science experience for students. In many ways, it's the premier academic experience we can offer any of our students. In partnership with the University at Albany, students simultaneously earn high school credit and university credit. It's a leg up after high school, certainly. Finally, what makes Hampton Bay's program so special is Dr. Forsberg's use of the word applied. In many places, science research is engineered in such a way that resources are dedicated to a particular issue or field of study, but that's not so in Hampton Bays. Working with students from the very first day of freshman year, Dr. Forsberg, the student, and their family begin a journey to apply their knowledge, talents, and passion to find the right topic. Research is a hands-on contact sport, and because it's so intense and requires such an investment of time and brain power, we want students applying themselves to the scientific questions that concern them specifically. So there's no textbook, there's no workbook, and the students are working on a different curriculum every single day in the same classroom. I offer my thanks to Dr. Stephanie Forsberg for her coordination of this program. She demands excellence of herself and her students. The young women who you will meet tonight will thrive in life, not just because of their knowledge of content, because of, but also because of the soft skills that they've honed in their time here. Professionalism, public speaking, self-advocacy, and so much more. I wish to recognize all of our colleagues in the science department because that value is true across all the disciplines in the department. We recognize that the complement of programs that we offer both enrich and build on science research. Our students are ready to show you how their questions, their unique approaches, and their imagination are going to make real scientific advances in the future. Thank you for being here with us tonight. Enjoy the opportunity to sit back, learn something new, and meet a wonderful, interesting group of students. Enjoy your time at the new virtual Hampton Bays High School. Like in the building, you are most welcome here always. I'd like to, at this point, introduce to you Dr. Stephanie Forsberg. Good evening, and thank you, Mr. Clemenson, and thank you to the Hampton Bays School District, our Board of Education, and most importantly, to all of you for your support and for attending our seventh annual Science Research Symposium. While it might be in a new setting tonight, we appreciate you viewing with us because it demonstrates the importance that we still must place on education on a daily basis. Sharing our scientific findings and most importantly, student research and science research in general. As we depend on science and those essential minds now more than ever. We know that there are multiple levels of grief that we are all experiencing right now, and we must acknowledge that. That grief may be the loss of loved ones, the battle with this virus within the human body, the grief of having our normal classroom, our auditorium, our experiences removed suddenly from our lives. But despite this grief, we must look for what good has come. What I have learned these past weeks, I have learned from these students that we have amazing, amazing students across Hampton Bays and beyond. Tonight you're watching because you know those students and in some aspect, our school district has reached you. You may be a parent, a teacher, a mentor, an elected official. We have many here tonight, including Fred Thiel and many others. We thank you all for your extended work as well as you could be a family member, an extended family member from across the country or around the globe or a neighbor. We thank you all. While we could focus on what is missing tonight or what tonight is not, I choose to look at what tonight is. Tonight's an amazing platform to have hope and a promise for our future. The future of the next generation of scientists, for these students, 
for their work to reach a larger audience than ever before. Thank you for all taking your time to be with us this evening. I will now move on to our science research students and let them introduce themselves and transition into the live slides of their research and what they've been working on for four years. After the four presentations, you'll be able to type in your questions into the Facebook Live comment thread and we will have the students answer those questions after we go through all of the four talks. Thank you again and welcome to our 2020 Hampton Bays Science Research Symposium. Hi, I'm Lily Candelaria. We just want to thank you again for tuning in tonight. Here's my talk on elbow injuries in throwing athletes. Hello, my name is Lily Candelaria, and today I'll be presenting my science research experience, which has been centered around the topic of bibliographic research of modifiable risk factors associated with elbow injury in professional baseball pitchers. I chose this topic because right around the time freshman year when we were trying to decide on what we wanted to research for the next four years, I actually happened to earn a starting catching position on the varsity softball team because the previous catcher had torn her rotator cuff in her shoulder and she needed surgery that would leave her unable to play for the remainder of the season. And since I just love softball so much and it's been a part of my life since I was eight years old, I cared a lot about this issue and how it was seeming to be happening all around me in the multiple softball teams that I played on. So I genuinely just wanted to know the answer to the question of why these injuries occur so frequently and how they can be prevented early on. So as I did some background research based on some work that had been performed in my area, I learned that this issue regarding injuries in the elbow and the shoulder happened in all overhead sports, not just baseball and softball. So I knew this was something that I definitely wanted to look into further. So during my sophomore year, I was able to meet with my mentor for the very first time in New York City. My mentor is Dr. Joshua Dines. He is an orthopedic surgeon at the Hospital for Special Surgery in New York City. He specializes in sports medicine, which is what I'm interested in, so he's definitely been a big help in really just solidifying my love for this field, and he's provided me with a lot of resources and cutting-edge research and data that hasn't even been published yet, and it's really great that he has been able to volunteer so much time to help me with my research, because in between his surgeries at the hospital, he also has to travel a lot for his work, and he is the team doctor for the New York Mets baseball team. However, after Dr. Dines and I really solidified our mentorship, he really just sent me a lot of background research that him and his team have done based on something called the modus throw compression sleeve. So this is just a sleeve worn similar to how you would wear an Under Armour thermal shirt. And really it just has a sensor located on the medial elbow and it detects the number of variables that occur as a result of throwing. And these variables are transmitted via Bluetooth to a smartphone application. And a lot of research has been done using this sleeve because it's cutting edge, it's less expensive, and it provides game-like data as opposed to data from the laboratory setting. And the smartphone application allows trainers and coaches and even players to know how many more high effort throws a player will have left. And this way, it is easier to detect which variables lead to a higher injury risk in athletes. So for my sophomore year, after I established my mentorship, I really just focused on the validity of the modus sleeve and the mechanics of injury risk in general. 
And then my junior year, I actually compared baseball pitching mechanics to football quarterback mechanics. And the image on the top right hand portion of the screen is actually the same player playing both baseball and football. So it just shows how the two can be compared. And really, I just learned that baseball pitchers acquire more chronic injury, whereas football players acquire more acute injuries as a result of contact. And then for the remainder of my junior year and my senior year, I researched both rotational kinematics and their connection with elbow injury risk, particularly in the forearm. And I also researched something called the acute to chronic workload ratio, which is a measure of athlete preparedness in that it compares the amount of effort and competition an athlete has prepared for over time to a daily spike in training load. So one of the great experiences that I was able to have as a result of this program and my mentorship with Dr. Dines was something called the Academic Visitor Program at the Hospital for Special Surgery. So the image on the right is Dr. Dines and I on the surgical floor in between his cases that I was able to observe in the operating room at the Hospital for Special Surgery. And the image on the left is just my pass that I had to wear for this program. And I really enjoyed being able to see the surgeries firsthand, and I was able to pinpoint some of the techniques they were using to some techniques that I have researched in my articles previously. And really, I just solidified my love for this field and my goals of potentially entering the fields of orthopedic surgery in the future. So just some cases that I actually got to see. I got to see torn rotator cuff repair, torn ulnar collateral ligament repair, which is in the elbow. I got to see torn disc repair, which is in the knee. I was able to see injuries as a result of weightlifting, which is also very prevalent today in the form of a torn pectoral muscle and a torn bicep repair. And one of my favorite cases, which was actually very lengthy, was a fractured humeral head, which if you can picture the shoulder as a ball and socket joint, the humeral head is the ball part of that joint. So Dr. Dines and his team actually fixed this fracture with multiple metal screws, and it was unlike anything I'd ever seen or imagined before, and it was just really awesome to watch. So some other experiences that I was able to have as a result of this program. On the left is two underclassmen and I as part of the Spark Northwell Health Spark Challenge at Peconic Bay Medical Center. So this program was just a one-day event where the Hampton Bay Science Research Program was able to go to PBMC and observe different careers and just see what a day in the hospital was like. So I was able to visit the physical therapy center, which was relevant to my research, so I really enjoyed that. And we were able to interact with patients, which is also something very unique. And then on the right is an image of me with Amanda Rogers. So she is a occupational therapist at Southside Hospital in Bayshore, New York. And during my junior year, I was able to observe patient appointments of hers weekly. And sometimes I was even able to witness the neurological rehab appointments, which was also very new to me. And I really enjoyed watching those. So next fall, I will be attending New York University to major in biology and follow the pre-medicine track at the College of Arts and Science. Dr. Dines and I have agreed to continue my mentorship with him as we'll be in the same city. That's one of the big reasons I chose to commit to NYU. And I will also be playing for their intercollegiate softball team which I'm very excited for because I get to continue the sport that I love while pursuing the field that I love. And I eventually hope to enter the field of orthopedic surgery 
because I was really inspired by Dr. Dines these past four years. And I can't wait to see what the future brings. I want to be anywhere without the Hampton Bay Science Research Program. So I really thank Dr. Forsberg and the Hampton Bay community for allowing my classmates and I to pursue such high level science research in high school, which definitely has elevated us in public speaking, professionalism, and just overall problem solving. So I really thank Dr. Forsberg and Hampton Bay for that. And I also thank you for tuning in to our very first virtual symposium. I hope you stay healthy in this time. And if you have any questions, please feel free to ask during the question session. Thank you. Thank you, Lily. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Daniels. Today we'll watch a video presentation on my topic, the link between diabetes, colon cancer, and other complications. Everyone, my name is Elizabeth Daniels and I'm a senior in the Hampton Bay Science Research Program. I first just wanted to say thank you so much for joining us on our online symposium this year. It really means a lot to all of us in the program that you all came to watch and listen to our presentations. Today I will be discussing my topic over the past four years, the link between diabetes, colon cancer, and other complications. I chose this topic because my mom and a few of my cousins have type 1 diabetes and it was always something that I've wanted to learn more about. So just a little background information, throughout these four years, the main focus of my research is diabetes. So what is diabetes exactly? Diabetes is a disease that occurs when your blood glucose is too high. Blood glucose is the main source of energy in the body and it comes from the food we eat. There are two types of diabetes, type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes. Type 1 diabetes is a chronic condition where the pancreas produces little of insulin. Insulin is a hormone made by the pancreas that helps glucose from food get into your cells to be used for energy. Type 1 diabetes cannot be cured. On the other hand, type 2 diabetes is a condition that affects the way your body metabolizes glucose, and this can be managed by your diet and your exercise. Another large component of my research is cancer. What is cancer? Cancer is a disease in which abnormal cells divide uncontrollably and destroy body tissue. My research is primarily on colon cancer. So why is this important? About 1.6 million Americans have type 1 diabetes. More than 30 million Americans have type 2 diabetes. And diabetes is the seventh leading cause of death in the U.S. Concerning cancer, more than 1.7 million Americans are diagnosed with some form of cancer each year. Around 600,000 Americans die of cancer each year. And cancer is the second leading cause of death in the U.S., with colon cancer being the third most common cancer. So as you can see, these are two very serious diseases. During my presentation, I'll keep referring back to this timeline of my research. So first thing with my beginning research, this is basically just my research from freshman year. I focused on a complication of diabetes that affects the eyes called diabetic retinopathy. Pictured here is an example of diabetic retinopathy in the retina. This is caused by damage to the blood vessels in the tissue of the retina and leads to impaired vision or even blindness. And pictured here, you can see the difference between a normal, healthy eye and one with diabetic retinopathy. Although this isn't important to my current research, it goes to show another complication of diabetes. Moving on to my mentorship and volunteering and shadowing. I solidified my mentorship in the summer between my freshman and sophomore years. My mentor is Dr. Joshua Miller, an endocrinologist at Stony Brook University Hospital who specializes in diabetes and metabolism. Dr. Miller has been so instrumental throughout my time in this program and has provided me with so many amazing opportunities. During the summer of 2018, I had the amazing opportunity to do a lot of work at the hospital. Three days a week, I would go to the hospital and volunteer under the Department of Patient Education. I would go around the hospital asking patients if they wanted to join Patient Portal and enter their information into a program called Citrix. Pictured here is what the patient would see on Patient Portal. So as you can see, this gave patients access to things like their health record, lab results, enabling them to renew medications, and much more. I also had the amazing opportunity of shadowing members of Dr. Miller's research team, including medical students Ying Zhang and Kenneth Chow. Here you can see myself with Dr. Miller and the research team. They showed me the consent form for their study, which researched the relationship between diabetes and colon cancer. 
I also had the opportunity of seeing what it was like to enroll patients into a study. This was such a great opportunity for me and I really learned a lot about conducting research. On to my developing research. With the help of Dr. Miller, we formulated my research question, which is, does poor diabetes management lead to an increased risk for colon cancer? To answer this question, I used the data from Dr. Miller's study. A number of predictors were used to determine if poor diabetes control leads to colon cancer, including gender, age, BMI, which is body mass index, tobacco exposure, aspirin use, and whether or not the patient had diabetes. We only looked at type 2 in this study. I worked with statistician Aaron Taub at Stony Brook Hospital to analyze the data, and we concluded that those who are male have a significantly higher percentage of having at least one adenoma when compared to females. An adenoma is a benign tumor. Patients who have at least one adenoma have a significantly higher median age when compared to those who do not have an adenoma. People who are obese have a significantly higher percentage of having at least one adenoma when compared to those being underweight or overweight. Tobacco exposure is seen to have a higher percentage of having at least one adenoma when compared to no tobacco exposure. The use of aspirin is seen to have a higher percentage in having at least one adenoma when compared to those who do not use aspirin. Those who have diabetes are seen to have a significantly higher percentage of having at least one adenoma when compared to those without diabetes. Therefore, we proved our research question to be correct. Poor diabetes control may lead to an increased risk for colon cancer. After we concluded this research, Dr. Miller and I met this past summer to discuss the next direction of our research we would be moving in, which is the relationship between diabetes and gut bacteria. When we met, Dr. Miller asked me, do you drink milk because you might change your mind? I was instantly intrigued and began my bibliographic research on this topic. After reading a lot of articles on this topic, I've learned a lot about the gut bacteria in the body and its potential relationship with diabetes. I won't spend too much time discussing this since it's a fairly new topic, but I just want to point out some important pieces of information. When we hear the word bacteria, we tend to think of negatives, and although bacteria can be harmful, it can also benefit the body. Gut microflora is actually important in regulating inflammatory responses and maintaining immune homeostasis. Gut bacteria can be harmful as well due to the change in their composition when the gut ecosystem undergoes abnormal changes like the use of antibiotics, illness, stress, aging, bad dietary habits, and lifestyle. For example, diets high in iron can change the composition of gut bacteria and contributes to colonization of bacterial pathogens, leading to an increased risk for colon cancer. This is really important because it shows the connection to my previous research with diabetes and colon cancer. Prebiotics and probiotics, however, can be used to fight obesity commonly seen in type 2 diabetes. Some examples of this are asparagus, bananas, yogurt, and kombucha. So for the future after high school, I do plan on going to college with a major in biology. I also hope to continue research in college as it's been such a large part of my life for the past four years. I'm so thankful to Dr. Miller, this program, and especially Dr. Forsberg. She's really prepared me for college, and being in this program has really helped me decide what I want to do in life after high school. Thank you so much again for coming to our online symposium this year and for listening to my talk on my research, the link between diabetes, colon cancer, and other complications. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Hello everyone, I'm Sky McMorris and my research is centered around the field of sensory biology. Thank you for watching and if you have any questions, please feel free to ask later and enjoy my video presentation. Hello everyone and welcome to the Science Research Symposium. My name is Sky McMorris and my research topic is the sensory regulation of settlement and metamorphosis by the ectopleuric crocea. I'll start by introducing my mentor. I established a mentorship during the summer going into my sophomore year, and his name is Dr. David Plachetsky. He's a professor at the University of New Hampshire, and his research is centered around the sensory evolution of a group of organisms called cnidarians. Through working with Dr. Plachetsky, I've also had the opportunity to work alongside one of the graduate students in his lab named Miss Sydney Birch, who I'm pictured with during one of my visits to the university. In this presentation, I will be explaining my time in the science research program and the experiments that I conducted with my mentors. 
Collaboration with the Plachetsky Lab led to the development of my research question, which is, what sensory cues regulate the settlement and metamorphosis of the ectoplora crocea? As I mentioned earlier, Dr. Plachetsky studies organisms called cnidarians. The phylum cnidaria consists of over 11,000 different species, including sea anemones, corals, and jellyfish. The defining characteristic that unites all cnidarians, including the ectoplora crocea, is that they all have a cell type known as a cnidocyte. This is the stinging cell that contains the venom associated with a jellyfish sting. The ectoplora crocea is part of class of organisms called hydrozoans. A well-known hydrozoan is the Portuguese man of war, which is the third most venomous cnidarian and is often mistakenly referred to as a jellyfish. Ectoplora are found in temperate waters on the east coast of the United States and are also found as an invasive species in European waters. Zooming out on an image of ectoplora may make them more recognizable. Here we have an image that was taken at the Coastal Marine Laboratory in New Hampshire, and this cage is completely covered with ectoplora. This brings us to the central issue behind the purpose of this research. The growth of any organisms on a submerged object is known as biofouling. We see this on docks and underneath boats, and biofouling itself is not necessarily an issue. As I mentioned earlier, the ectoplora crocea is a cnidarian and therefore has the stinging cnidocytes on its tentacles. And so as you can imagine, having a net or cage completely fouled by ectoplora creates an unhealthy environment for any captured fish. There is no current preventative for biofouling, and this has a negative impact on the commercial fishing industry as well as aquaculture facilities. With conservative estimates of a 10% economic loss, biofouling is the largest obstacle in the aquaculture industry. The ongoing research at the Plachetsky Lab looks to determine what sensory cues the ectoplora crocea take in the environment in order to find the best substrate on which to begin growing a colony. This information can then be used to help prevent ectoplora and other hydrozoans from causing biofouling on certain objects. In order to determine which senses are involved in the settlement of the ectoplora, we followed the development of the different ectoplora larval stages using light as a stimulus. I'll be explaining the three most relevant stages. In these experiments, we started from the star-shaped embryo stage. Typically, the embryos develop in the maternal gonophores, which are the reproductive organs of the ectoplora, but it's not uncommon for them to be prematurely released. Next, we have the actinula larva. This is when the ectoplora is actively moving throughout the water column in search of a suitable substrate to settle upon. Finally, once the larva has permanently attached itself to the substrate and the metamorphosis into a polyp is complete, the ectoplora can begin to grow a colony. All the specimen collection for this research was done at the Coastal Marine Laboratory, or CML, which works in conjunction with the University of New Hampshire. Dr. Plachetsky and another student from the lab dove to colonies of ectoplora, but as indicated by the white arrow, the issue of biofouling was apparent even at the surface. We then transported the collected ectoplora back to the Plachetsky lab, and I picked out all the star-shaped embryos that I could find using a pipette and a light microscope. The sensory stimulus being tested on the ectoplora in this research is light, and the conditions I chose were no light versus high-intensity green light. These conditions were achieved by placing petri dishes of the ectoplura in separate boxes, and although I only chose green light for my experiment, Ms. Birch's research included multiple wavelengths of light, which I'll be including in my explanation of the results at the end of the presentation. Approximately two hour intervals, I would remove the petri dishes from their respective conditions, and using a dissecting microscope, I would count and categorize the different stages of larval development. For example, if I was looking at this image underneath the microscope, I would mark down on my data sheet that I had seen one actinula larva and one polyp. The graph on the left shows the difference between the mean settlement percentage of ectoplura based on the presence or absence of light. The presence of light is shown by the orange line, and light was found to have significantly increased the number of settled ectoplura. As I mentioned earlier, and as seen in the graph on the right, Ms. Birch included additional wavelengths of light in this research. Although it appears that green light caused increased settlement, it was found that the color of light didn't play a statistically significant role in the settlement behavior of the ectoplora. 
Moving forward, now that we have shown that lighting does play a role in the settlement and metamorphosis of the Ectoplorocrustia, Ms. Birch will continue with this research by monitoring which specific genes are expressed to control this behavioral response. Again, this is all to learn more about the settlement behavior of the Ectoplorocrustia in order to find a preventative for biofouling. As for my own future, I will be attending the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, where I plan on majoring in biochemistry and continuing to pursue research. Much of this decision has come from my time in the science research program, and I would like to thank Dr. Forsberg for all of her help and support throughout these past four years. Thank you for tuning in, and if you have any questions about my research, please feel free to ask during our question session. Thank you, Sky. My name is Riley Stotsky, and I will be presenting my research on influenza. I just want to reiterate our gratitude for coming to our first ever virtual symposium and taking the time to learn about our projects. We really appreciate it. Influenza epidemiology in the United States from 2017 to 2018. If you have any questions about my research, I will be happy to answer them at the end of this session. Riley Stotsky and I'm a senior in the science research program at Hampton Bates High School. Thank you so much for taking the time to learn about our research over these past four years in the program. Today I will be presenting my research on influenza epidemiology in the United States from 2017 to 2018. When I started in the science research program in the fall of 2016, I was excited to have the opportunity to dive deeply into a research project of my interest. At that time, West Africa was suffering from the Ebola outbreak. The world was also experiencing multiple cases of the Zika virus. These circumstances, along with my interest in global issues, led to me studying infectious disease epidemiology. As I developed my topic further, I chose to focus specifically on influenza epidemiology. This allowed me to study a topic that specifically relates to our community as we observe seasonal outbreaks of the flu. Influenza is a constantly evolving virus that evades long-term control measures. The international community also sees seasonal outbreaks, and that has allowed me to research a topic that has both local and global implications. I also chose to study flu spread by focusing on its epidemiology. Epidemiology is the study and analysis of the distribution, patterns, and determinants of diseases. This involves the use of phylogenetic trees. In order to explain what phylogenetic trees are, it is easiest to relate to something we should all have some familiarity with, family trees. For the purposes of this presentation, I will be using a family tree from the well-known television series, Game of Thrones. As you can see, this is a family tree of the Stark family. It follows the basic family tree patterns of having the eldest relatives at the top of the tree and the younger ones at the bottom of the tree. Those that are more related to each other are closer together on the tree. If we simply rotate this tree, it becomes the format of a phylogenetic tree. This is a sample of a phylogenetic tree in which strains A, B, C, D, and E are identified. Phylogenetic trees show patterns and relations in the evolution of a virus. Time develops from the left end of the tree to the right end. In this specific tree, A and B are more closely related to each other than A and C are. In this presentation, I will be specifically focusing on my research question of whether there is a stronger emphasis on the spatial or temporal spreading on the mixing and evolution of influenza in the United States from 2017 to 2018. All of my research that I will be presenting today is under the guidance of my mentors at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. If that name sounds familiar, it is because they are currently leading coronavirus research and often referenced by many news outlets. In my sophomore year, I emailed Dr. Lesser, who is a professor of epidemiology at Johns Hopkins. He agreed to be my mentor after an in-person meeting at the Bloomberg School in the December of my sophomore year. Due to his busy schedule, I was also mentored by Dr. Chasen, who was a PhD student working with Dr. Lessler at the time. I corresponded with them by email and Skype conferences over these past three years. I have also had the ability to research with them at the Bloomberg School of Public Health in Baltimore in the summer after my sophomore year. 
They have introduced me to many aspects of disease research and guided me through the process of developing my topic and research. They are both currently a part of the response to COVID-19. For my research on influenza, I chose to analyze the 2017 to 2018 flu season because there was a significant increase in cases that season. I also chose to study strains from the states of California, New York, Texas, and Michigan so that I could analyze the spread of the flu across the United States during that time period. I used the program GenBank to obtain publicly available influenza strains that I studied in the phylogenetic trees. I used the software Mega7 to form the phylogenetic trees and to align the DNA of each strain. I then used FigTree to analyze the trees I had made. Pictured here is one of the earlier trees I made in which I was specifically looking at the spread between California and New York. Using FigTree, I was able to color code the branches depending on where each strain was from which allows me to study the spread more clearly. Today, I will be presenting this tree. This tree involves 16 randomly chosen strains of influenza A, H3N2, with four strains from each state, California, New York, Texas, and Michigan. This is the same tree color-coded by the state it was taken from. This is also the same tree, except it is color-coded by the month it was collected. In order to understand the first multicolored tree, we can focus on a specific section of the tree. If we look at the zoomed in section of the tree, it shows four strains that are more closely related to each other than they are to any other strains on the tree because they all diverged at the same point evolutionarily. This is the same section of the tree, but color coded according to the state it is from. Red for California, blue for New York, green for Texas, and purple for Michigan. As I stated before, this shows spatial mixing because these four strains are more closely related to each other than they are to any other strains on the tree that are from the same state. When we look at the tree as a whole, this pattern is also made clear by the green Texas strain at the top section of the tree that we were just looking at compared to the green Texas strain at the bottom of the tree that also developed earlier on. This proves that there is spatial mixing in the development of the flu season. In other words, the flu didn't just evolve within specific regions or communities. Due to human migratory patterns such as airplane travel, the flu spread across spatial boundaries. For the other half of my research question, I looked at the same tree, but I color-coded the branches based on the data that strain was collected. All of the samples I randomly used in this tree were from the months stated here, which aligns with when we normally see the peak of flu season. I color-coded them along a gradient from dark blue to light blue, corresponding with the months I assigned to each color. The earliest strain was the one highlighted here, which is from July, and seen at the beginning of the tree. Then September, October, November, December, January, and lastly, February. When compiled together, this shows a relative temporal development that is to be expected in which most of the darker strains are seen earlier in the tree and lighter strains seen later. When I color-coded this tree on fig tree, I reached the same conclusions of relative temporal development, which shows how the strain evolved throughout the flu season. The main conclusions that can be taken from this phylogenetic tree is that the flu is a constantly evolving virus and that it does not develop isolated in specific communities. It spreads throughout different areas of the country due to different human migratory patterns. While I did not specifically study coronavirus in this research project, there are some mirroring results between the flu and COVID-19. As we saw with the phylogenetic trees, it evolves from different regions of the United States because of our travel patterns. This supports the social distancing policies that are being implemented in response to the COVID-19 pandemics our global community is currently dealing with. It is essential that we distance ourselves in order to slow the spread and give researchers the time they need to develop vaccines and other control measures. Furthering my education, I will be attending Clemson University next year. I will be majoring in political science with a mathematical focus. While I'm not going directly into the fields of epidemiology, my involvement in this program has allowed me to further develop my interest because I was able to study the social implications flu spread has using mathematical models. I also analyzed policy that was made in response to these global epidemics.
After a series of interviews, I have been selected to be a part of the National Scholar Program at Clemson. Through this program, I will take specialized courses, network with alumni and faculty, and study abroad to various locations across the globe. Seeing as I was the only one in the Northeast selected for this program, being chosen for this program is a huge honor and I couldn't be more excited. I also have plans to continue my involvement in research by being a part of Dr. Fine's social media research team at Clemson. Dr. Fine is a political science professor at Clemson. I will also be participating in research through Clemson's research program known as Creative Inquiry. The science research program has been one of the most formative things I have experienced in my high school career, and I would not be where I am today without the guidance of both my mentors, Dr. Lessler and Dr. Chasen at Johns Hopkins, and Dr. Forsberg, who has been an amazing mentor to me over these past four years. That has been my presentation on influenza epidemiology in the United States from 2017 to 2018. If you have any questions about my research, I will be happy to answer them at the end of this session. Hi, my name is Riley Stotsky and I'm a C. Thank you, Riley. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Chris Richard and I am the very proud principal uh, at Hampton Bays High School. And while I offer a few closing remarks, we're going to encourage uh, all of our viewers on Facebook to offer a few questions uh, for our research scientists. Uh, each and every year, I talk about this program as the realization of a professional dream. And I think every educator would agree that learning on this level is simply incredible. Science research under Dr. Forsberg has brought Hampton Bays all over the nation from the labs at UC Davis in California, to Baltimore, to New York City, to New Hampshire, uh, Washington DC, Plum Island, and more in pursuit of learning and solutions to complex problems. These young ladies uh, that you've met tonight have literally taken us to the next level. And this fall, Lily, Elizabeth, Skye, and Riley will all be pursuing research at some highly competitive colleges. And I know they shared this with you this evening, but I'm gonna uh, talk about this for just a minute um, because it's really very impressive. Uh, Riley's been accepted to the National Scholars Program at Clemson University uh, and will be majoring in both political science and math in their honors college, a highly, highly selective program. Elizabeth will be attending the Hori Telephone Cooperative at the Coastal Carolina Honors College, majoring in biology, also continuing with research. Lily will continue her research with Dr. Dines at the Hospital for Special Surgery while studying uh, biology at NYU on a pre-med track. And Skye has been accepted to the, the very prestigious biotech program at UMass at Amherst. Um, some incredible accomplishments and, and, and some of the most impressive college acceptances that I have seen in my 25 years in this business. I thank you for joining us this evening and encourage everyone to ask our research scientists questions about their work and passion for research. Thank you and have a great night. Okay, thank you, Mr. Richard. Um, ladies, that remarkable presentations. Um, it's time for questions and answers from the audience. Uh, they've been uh, sending them in and we've been monitoring them through the chat. So we're gonna start with Lily. Can you hear me, Lily? Yes. Okay, this question is from uh, Assemblyman Fred Thiel, who is a lifelong baseball fan. So as a lifelong baseball fan, arm injuries and surgeries seem more prevalent today. Does the data support this? And if so, is there a reason? Um, yeah, definitely. So I, um, I looked in some of my research at different age levels and the injury rates amongst age levels. And younger baseball players are definitely becoming more injured nowadays because it's generally more competitive. There's a lot of travel leagues, travel levels, and kids are subjected to more playing time in with shorter rest periods. So that's definitely why there's um, higher injury rates. Good, thank you. And we have a second question from our audience. This one is gonna go for Elizabeth. So if Elizabeth, can, can you hear us okay? Okay, this comes from Ms. Tully, a fan of the science research program. She's asking, Elizabeth, is there any ongoing research about type 1 diabetes, which you reported as having no cure right now? Is it always inherited, type 1 diabetes? Um, that's a good question. So my research focused primarily um, on the relationship between diabetes and colon cancer. And with that, um, 
we looked at only type 2 diabetes, so that's what the majority of my research focused on. And type 2 diabetes can be reversed through diet and exercise. Um, I didn't focus that much on type 1 diabetes due to this, so um, I don't have that much background knowledge of it. Um, I know that there are researchers constantly working for a cure, so hopefully that could happen one day, but I personally didn't research that much about it. But for type 2, there definitely is a way to reverse that. Very good. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, we have a, a question for Sky from also from Ms. Tully. Can you hear me, Sky? Yes. Very good. So um, for you, Sky, what triggered your interest in this marine study? And uh, not so much of a question, but a suggestion, because Mrs. Tully would like you to consider sharing this study um, at SOFO in Bridgehampton uh, later this summer when it's appropriate to do so. So what triggered your interest in this marine study? Well, I was interested in studying something with marine biology that particularly impacted Long Island. So at the beginning of the program, I was looking at ecological impacts of certain marine invertebrates, such as tenophores, which are also known as comb jellies. And then once I solidified my mentorship at the University of New Hampshire, I began my more in-depth research into this specific type of cnidarian. But overall, I really wanted to research something that I could relate back to a large part of our community in Hampton Bays and on Long Island and I would definitely love to continue sharing this research at any time appropriately in the future. Wonderful, so great global work that's going to help us locally. Thank you, Sky. Riley, can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> okay, hi Riley. We have a question from Alex Peterson who uh, was one of the inaugural members of the Hampton Bays Science Research Program seven years ago. Uh, from Alex, Riley, did you analyze the whole genome, all the segments, or just specific genes? Oh, hi, Alex. And that's a great question. Um, I didn't specifically focus too much on the genetics of my research. I actually had a lot of help from my mentors on that part. Um, but I did specifically use that program that I had mentioned in my talk. I used Mega7, and that actually helped me align the DNA. So I didn't have to worry too much about that aspect of my research, but I know people are specifically talking about whether they study the whole genome or not. Um, I don't have that specific answer because luckily I was able to use the program and I didn't have to focus specifically on that aspect, but it's something I'll definitely look into. Thanks. That was another great question. Um, the next question is going to be for Lily. Lily, can you hear us okay? You can hear me okay? Yeah. So Lily, this is coming from a member of our audience. They're wanting to know, would the football player also develop the same type of injury as the baseball player if it weren't for the interruption, as, if, as it were of the acute injuries? Um, well, there is some frequency of overuse injuries in football, similar to what we see in baseball. However, um, most of the research findings are that Football players are mainly just um, more subjected to acute injuries as a result of um, oncoming players uh, and tackles and that kind of stuff. So um, since baseball is really non-contact, they mainly just get the overuse injuries that occur chronically. So, Okay, that makes, that makes sense. Elizabeth, if you could unmute yourself, this next question is for you. So... Elizabeth, were you always interested in this topic? Did it evolve at all? I you know we're talking about how it related to two different types of ailments, you know, diabetes, also colon cancer. How did that develop? Was it always linked? Was it always something you wanted to work on? So um, as part of the entrance into this program, we have to go through a series of interviews and write an essay. And um, I wrote my essay about um, diabetes, my interest in it. Um, originally, I was more um, interested in type 1 diabetes because I have some family members with type 1 diabetes, but um, after solidifying my mentorship with Dr. Miller, I focused more on type 2 diabetes and colon cancer because that's what he was currently researching at the time, and I grew to absolutely love the topic, and it's still something that I'm very interested in today, and I hope to continue researching more about it in the future as well. Great. Thank you so much. Sky, and we're moving on to a question for you, um, very appropriately, because we have a Bayman audience here tonight. So the question has to do specifically about biofouling. And is 
biofouling, are there other preventative measures that fishermen can take to prevent this on their fishing gear? And is there anything else being currently researched to, to take care of that? Well, most frequently what fishermen will try to do is power wash any equipment that they have. And this has actually shown that the ectoplora or other types of hydrozones will come back at an increased rate. So currently researchers are trying to look into different materials that they could use for nets or cages. Some of the materials that they're looking into are copper coated nets as well as micro topographies, which means that there are tiny indentations that could potentially prevent hydrozones from being able to attach them Themselves. So there is no permanent preventative, but these are some of the different research paths that scientists are taking currently. Great. Thank you so much for that. Riley, this is our last question that we have time for this evening. And um, we just encourage you that all of our members of our audience that if you have more questions, I know our researchers would love to get back to you, but just to be respectful of everyone's time, this will be our last question tonight. So Riley, this question is an interesting one because your study that you mentioned of influenza had to do with 2017 and 2018. And was there any patterns that were seen in the later flu seasons? And the last connection of this is kind of a projection that we mentioned earlier is in the world of viruses that we're living today, thinking about COVID-19, how it could evolve and we're seeing evolutions possibly in short term, but in long term. So relating it back to your work, the question being the 2017-18 data that you presented tonight, were there changes that happened? And is there a connection that you could possibly see to COVID? That's a great question. So I originally chose to focus on the 2017 to 2018 season because we did see that increase in the number of cases that season. So I thought it'd be a great one to look at, especially during our limited high school time. And so what I found with that was the social mixing that I presented. And that's definitely one of those things that has occurred within each flu season that we're seeing and definitely carries through to coronavirus, where we're seeing this social mixing going on. And if we didn't put in place the social distancing policies, we would see this global spread and we'd have these phylogenetic trees that are developing different branches where there's locations that spatially are very different from each other. But if we're looking at the evolution of the virus, they'd be very close because we are comparing these contacts because of different airplane travel. And if we didn't put in place these social distancing policies. So that is an overarching result that Yes, I saw that looking at 2017 and 2018, and it's definitely carried through to future flu seasons and is definitely very present within this current coronavirus outbreak. Okay. Riley, thank you for that. Um, Lily, Elizabeth, Sky, um, I think everybody in the virtual world uh, who's been watching with us tonight, and there's been over a hundred watching live and that number will just continue to grow tonight and into tomorrow and the days ahead. Um, without question, um, you are just some of the very best young women um, and representative of the Hampton Bays. We're so proud of you and the work that you're doing. Um, and every single one of you is doing something so important um, that really begins today as you graduate because this work is gonna continue. Uh, so thank you. Um, thanks for being on your feet and ready for those questions. Um, they were not preloaded questions. They were coming in in real time. Um, tonight was our virtual opportunity to be together. Uh, and as I scrolled through the participant list, it uh, consisted of our Board of Education, um, our elected officials, the board of the university and the high school program at the University at Albany. We thank you again for your support. Um, parents, teachers, students, alumni, community members, um, in such a challenging time um, as we are in right now, this was a great symbol of community. Uh, we hashtag HB strong. Um, we hashtag we are HB. And um, it's more than just a hashtag. It's more than just words. And you are HB. Um, ladies, and um, we're so proud of you and thank you for that. For everybody who's been uh, viewing tonight, we thank you for being with us. Stay connected. Uh, tomorrow, we're going to resume with our 7 p.m. Bayman Bedtime Stories. Um, and next week, we look forward to 
uh, local heroes and essential workers bedtime stories. So we're turning over our Facebook to um, an ICU nurse from Southampton Hospital, uh, our a member uh, captain at the Hampton Bay's Volunteer Ambulance, Southampton Town Police Officers, Hampton Bay's Firemen, uh, all the folks who um, are literally on the front lines today, making sure uh, that we can get past this and that uh, these four young ladies and um, the 2,100 kids that they represent as their peers and classmates can get back to real life um, as soon as possible. So thank you all for being here. Uh, this link will be put up on the school district's webpage. So we encourage you to, to share that link broadly um, because we can't celebrate uh, the work that's been done and these young ladies um, enough. In two weeks uh, from tonight on May 7th, I want you to tune back in with us uh, because there are 17 other students who you need to meet. These are the underclassmen uh, in the science research program, freshmen, sophomores, and juniors. They're each going to give a one minute talk. Uh, the, the science research program builds to senior year until we can spotlight uh, what you just saw. Um, but leading up to that, uh, these students have been creating poster presentations and they're gonna give you a one minute talk um, of the research that they're engaged in. You're not gonna to wanna to miss that. So two weeks from tonight, Thursday, May 7th at 7 p.m. Dr. Forsberg, uh, thank you for your leadership of this program. Mr. Richard, for your leadership of the high school as well. We thank all of our faculty and staff um, and the Hampton Bay's community. Again, we're HB strong, we are HB. Thanks for tuning in tonight. Have a great evening, be safe and stay healthy.